Hey there. I noticed you, but I'm pretending I didn't. I'm just reading a book, hanging out. Uh, it's actually one of my favorites. It's uh, Envoy to Varlamore by Derek Paulson. It's a great read. Now, it turns out that there are a lot of books in RuneScape, and most of us just open them up so we can progress further into whatever quest we're doing. But what's actually written there? I decided to find out, and some of what I found is strange, and I've decided to share some of my favorites with you. I've divided this video up into two main parts, the funny books and the mysterious books. Now let's get started with some of the funnier ones I've found. I do not have a sponsor for this video, but we're gonna start with ads anyway, found in my notes or the Barbarian Training Guide. I'd like to read three entries of this book to you, starting with entry 21 and ending with entry 23. Entry 21. The door resists all of our efforts to penetrate it, even the fishing explosives which Daryl suggested were tried with no success. There must be some way through which is linked to magic, though perhaps all who know the secret are now long dead. Entry 22. Bye from Bob's brilliant axes. If you see our process better, let us know and we will beat them. Offer subject to availability and at Bob's discretion does not affect your legal rights under Lumbridge laws. Entry 23. Created spheres of power to support those who should come to that dread place thereafter, but the well senses the light of these spheres and will not. The rest is redacted. I have no idea what an advertisement for Bob's axes is doing in this book. At no point is an axe used, is Lumbridge mentioned, or is there a character named Bob, so my best guess... Man's gotta make his money! He had to take a sponsor to get his books out there, these important findings from this ancient cavern beneath the lake. I get it. I get it. Moving on from the whiplash of important findings to blatant advertising, I'd like to talk about the Lighthouse Manual. This book is used and found in the quest Horror from the Deep. Look, I'm here to help. I don't want you to make the same mistakes I did. I'm here to keep you out of legal trouble with Jossick, the man who owns the lighthouse. It turns out there are a couple of really easy ways to void the warranty on the lighthouse, and I do not want you to be responsible for that. So first, absolutely no swamp tar. Do not use swamp tar on the lighthouse. Immediately voids the warranty. Second, no molten glass. Absolutely not allowed. Please avoid both of these items at all costs. Here's the problem. In the quest, Horror from the Deep, you are prompted to repair the lighthouse using swamp tar and molten glass. This is a pickle. Now what do we do about this? Well, according to the lighthouse manual, you should immediately call an ADE, or an authorized dwarven engineer, and he will come help you. Do not attempt to do this by yourself. This is just a great way to get in trouble. Finally, there is a third way of avoiding the warranty that you should be aware of. Do not read their advertisement in the Varrock Herald. Don't do it. So just to be safe, never read the Varrock Herald. It's not worth it. Now, as Lightomatic, the company who makes the lighthouse says, Lightomatic, the brand you can sometimes trust. One more manual that I enjoyed reading is the Amkey Lift in a Box user manual, which is obtained during the Royal Trouble Quest. This is a great guide on troubleshooting your Amkey Lift in a Box. So first, make sure you're adding the pulleys and using them with a long top beam. They recommend using the Amkey pulley beams in a box. Make sure you're using a rope. They recommend using the Amkey ropes in a box. If the platform is broken, repair it with Amkey beams in a box. Finally, there is a disclaimer that Amkey lift in a box, Amkey pulley beams in a box, Amkey beams in a box, and Amkey ropes in a box are all registered trademarks of Amkey or Ali Morrisane Commercial Enterprises Limited. He's found his way to the Fremenic province, oh god. Speaking of Amkey products, it turns out the little book of piracy obtained after completing the Cabin Fever quest is a product of Captain Hookhand Morrisane. This book is needed to understand what any of the pirates on Mostly Harmless are saying, and it is divided into three sections. First, piracy justification, second, pirate fashion, and third, a pirate phrasebook. In the first section, Mr. Morrison claims that piracy is a noble and needed profession. Without piracy, the architects that design sea defenses against their attacks would be unemployed. In Chapter 2, Mr. Morrison posits that in order to be recognized as a pirate, you really have to look like a pirate, and his justification is that if you look like an accountant, then people will be confused when you begin talking about briny deep this and plundering that. 
And chapter three, like I said, is a pirate translation guide and phrasebook. Now there are a few phrases I'd like to make you aware of. First, Gar. There are three possible translations. I am going to attack you. Take this and it is time for fisticuffs and no mistake. I say we keel haul them. Translates to, I propose we do unpleasant things to them until they are dead, very sorry, or both. Want a sip of rum? Translates to, I would like to poison you. Parlay! Translates to, I have become tired of life. Kill me at your leisure. I'm not a pirate. I'm a privateer. Translates to, I am a pirate, and I'm getting paid for it. And finally, go see Ali. Travel to al Qurid to sell loot and purchase top quality products. There's a lot of funny stuff in this book. Honestly, if you're going to read any book in RuneScape, I'd recommend this one. There's a ton of funny references and stupid translations in the book, and the fact that Ali Morrison has managed to inject himself even into the farthest reaches of Mauritania, that tickles me. I like this one. Check it out. And now it's time for... Worms as a Sex Aid. The next book I want to talk about is Gian's Cookbook. This book is used in the Gnome Restaurant minigame, and I don't know about you, the only time I have ever done that minigame is in Leagues. Most of the book is pretty standard, it just describes how to cook the dishes in the minigame. There are two things that I thought were worth mentioning. First, in the entry for Toad Crunchies, the final sentence is, When Pukamai first made Toad Crunchies, everyone thought he was mad. Chewy toads in crunchies? It'll never work, they said. On its own, that's not really notable, but that is actually entry 14 in the Barbarian Training Notes. Verbatim. No idea how that got there, but thought that was worth bringing up. The second entry of note is that of the wormhole recipe, which is a hell of a name for a dish, but the final sentence says, Worms are specially favored by gnomes as they purportedly aid virility. Now, virility doesn't necessarily have to do with sexual prowess in this context. It can refer to any number of things regarding health. However, I'm going to choose to ignore that fact and claim that undeniably, gnomes use worms as a sexual aid. This is a strange hill to die on, but this is the one I'm choosing. This takes me into our next book, which is The Feathered Journal. This journal is found during the Eagle's Peak quest and describes how a group of bandits got stuck in the cave that contains the eagles. They had apparently just tried to raid the gnome stronghold and steal whatever they could get their hands on. Unfortunately, all they came away with was... Worms. So, there's four guys, on the run, trapped in this stronghold cave system, in the middle of nowhere, with nothing to eat but aphrodisiacs. I'm not saying what happened. They didn't say what happened. We, we can guess. We can guess. Now the second interesting thing about this book is how the bandits disappeared. They mentioned the mysterious old man, yes, the random event, the mysterious old man, showing up twice, and on the second time, they disappear and are never heard from again. Now Eagle's Peak was released in 2006, which is back when random events were still terrifying and by no means optional. I'm talking rock golems, tree spirits, evil chickens showing up and fucking you up. These were originally implemented as a form of anti-macro technology to stop players who were cheating. However, with the release of old school RuneScape, modern macro clients got pretty smart and these just weren't effective anymore and just became annoying, so random events were toned down and became optional and no longer killed you. However, this was not the case during Eagle's Peak, so these bandits were approached by the mysterious old man. And back then, the mysterious old man could do one of three things. One, he could send you to the maze. Two, he could send you to a mime show. And third, he could just give you a strange box which would give you a reward if you opened it. So what I'm guessing happened in this journal is, the first time the mysterious old man showed up, gave them a box, they got a thing, and he fucked off, and it was great. The second time, he showed up and he transported them to either the maze or the mime show, and they could not figure out how to get out. So, mysterious old man stopping criminals, way to go! The next book on my funny list is The Binding Book. This is part of Legends Quest, and it contains information on how to enchant vials. This lets you make holy water, which will weaken Nezekaned. The funny thing about this book is that it is written in dog Latin, which, no, it's not Latin for dogs, it's just fake Latin. Like, you know how Americans add O's to the end of words and pretend they're Spanish and think they're hilarious? Yeah, like that, but for Latin. So the four chapters are Arcana, Instructo, Defiti, and Enchanto. I wonder what those do. 
So the chapter Enchanto contains the enchantment. Wow. Which roughly translates to, You got an empty vial, we'll cast a spell on it. You cast the enchantment and then it'll be holy and you can use it to defeat the big bad boy. Then you gotta attack him from a little bit of a far away and throw things at him. Yeah. The next book on the list is The Bloody Grimoire, which is a book that can be found in the Sisterhood Sanctuary, which is where you fight the Nightmare of Ashihama. This book contains the recipes for four potions, two of which you probably know, two of which you might not. But first, let's talk about the Theater of Blood poll in March 2018. This pulled Mauritania things like the Theater of Blood and a Taste of Hope, but also pulled the addition of five new potions, two of which passed, three of which didn't. The ones that passed were the Bastion and Battle Mage potions. The three that didn't were the Vigor, Totality, and Super Prayer potions. The Totality potion would have been a combination of the Super Combat, Ranging, and Magic potions, which... Woo! Woo! That's a lot! The Vigor Potion would have been a combination of a Prayer Potion and a Weak Stamina Potion, which that sounds pretty nice too. And finally, the Super Prayer Potion was like a Prayer Potion, but super! That aside, let's get back to the Bloody Grimoire. Now this does contain the recipes for the Bastion and Battle Mage Potions, but it also contains the recipes for what would have been the Totality and Vigor Potions. These two potions, like their counterparts that did get added to the game, would have used blood as the base instead of water. The Totality Potion would have used another Torstall, and the Vigor Potion would have used an Amylase Crystal as well as a Renar Weed. The reason I find this funny is the reasons they gave for the potions not being in the game. For the Totality Potion, they said that the concoction was too unstable, making it dangerous to create, let alone drink. So it would be basically just ingesting a whole bunch of explosives and then lighting yourself on fire, and something like that. For the Vigor Potion, they just said an ingredient missing. They didn't say what, they didn't try anymore, they just, nah, it's, it's wrong, something's missing, let's move on. The final book I have on my funny list is The Strange Book, which is strange. This book can be taken from the wise old man's bookshelf in Drainer Village, cannot be stored in your house, and if you ask the wise old man to clear out your bank, he will look at this book and say, hey, that's mine, and take it back. There are four chapters in this book. The first two are just straight up philosophy discussions. The third one has to do with graphing algebraic equations, and the fourth one is just his rambling. Now the first three are all based on the works of René Descartes. You know, I think, therefore I am, that guy. So yeah, just straight up René Descartes' musings on philosophy and mathematics. So really important if you want to catch up on your Descartes, Drainer Village, that's your place. Now the fourth chapter is just called Reader's Comments, and it's intentionally left blank for the reader's comments. And let's hear what the wise old man had to say. First. Better now, walls look decent, nice and elegant. Those new lanterns were rip off, blasted dwarf craftsmen. Still not a problem for me. So he's racist against dwarves. Good to know. Next. Even got my old Ceridoman armor gilded. Beautiful gold edges on it now. No one else is going to have armor like that. That'll make him think. <laughs> now he's encouraging trimming scams. Wow. All right. Lick of gold leaf here and there. Even my globe looks smarter now. Maybe that bath screen was a bit much. No, I saw it. I wanted it as mine. Really Louis me, he asked. Still don't know what that thing is, but it looks nice on my desk. Probably some kind of transport. Must run off a of hot air or dragon flatulence. So he's a kleptomaniac. Good to know. Number four. Running a bit short of runes now. Those wizards over to the south always seem to have plenty, but will they spare me some? Bah! Not a chance, poxy mage scum. Perhaps another little expedition is needed. They all look pretty weedy over there. So he's threatening to kill mages for their runes. So what we learned is the wise old man kind of sucks. So that's the end of my funny section, and we can move on to the mysterious section. Now, I'm not going to say that this video is suddenly going to get super serious, but the books themselves aren't inherently funny from this point on. Some of them are spooky, some of them herald possible upcoming content, some of them both. So let's see what we got here. Starting off, this book kind of straddles the line between funny and mysterious, so it seemed like a good way to kick this section off. It's a book called On Leprechauns, and it's found in the Grand Library of Priftinus after completing Song of the Elves. It has nothing to do with any quest, it just kind of exists. Now let's hear what it has to say about these little guys. It is said that the leprechauns, so in tune with nature and growth, are to be treasured for their stewardship, but I have seen. I have seen their dark ways. Even the fairies have not been to the edge of things where the truth is hidden. We used to know why they are not permitted, but we have forgotten. And so I say this. 
fear the leprechaun. They watch, they wait, but theirs is a hungry patience. Grandmaster Leprechaun Quest when? The Library of Prifthiness is an interesting place because a lot of the books in it were actually submitted by users that won a contest to get their stuff put into the game, which is really cool. This one's not one of them. This one was written by Jagex. So I'm expecting some more uh, follow-up on this because currently there is no other reference to this book. There is no reason for it to be in the game. I want to see some evil leprechauns. This next book is pretty interesting. It's the Explorer's Notes, which is a journal you can find on the second floor of the Keldegrim Library. Again, it has nothing to do with any quests, and you don't ever have to read it. But what's interesting about it is it describes the Godwar's Dungeon two months before it was released. This book is the tale of Nestor Peregrine, a dwarven explorer from Keldegrim. Apparently, there were rumors of an ancient temple north of Trollheim, and it describes his attempts to get there. After finally finding a passage, he discovers the Godwar's Dungeon where he sees these ancient armies trapped in eternal battle, which we're all familiar with by now. Not wanting to deal with any of that shit, he ran away, but on his way back, he ran into a group of undead trolls that apparently somehow didn't notice him. And he finishes up this tale by describing that his journey may take him south, into the poison wastes. This book leaves us with some unanswered questions. First, what's up with these undead trolls? There are no undead trolls in the game yet. However, due to the fact that Godwar's Dungeon does exist and this book predates it, I assume the undead trolls do exist and so there must be some reason for his mentioning them. Second, why did he mention the Poison Waste? He's apparently now heard rumors that the wastes are traversable. Is he Zolra? Nah, he's not, I don't think he's Zolra, but he may show up in a future gnome quest because of the lost city of Arpasandra that we discovered in the Eyes of Glufri. So. If we see Nestor Peregrine show up as an NPC in any quests in that line, we know who he is. This next book is one I read and made fun of a little bit in the Mauritania episode of Worst in Slot. It's the Diary of Irby Flax, which is used to start the Shades of Morton quest. It describes the creation of serums 207 and 208, which cure villagers of this unknown affliction. As Mr. Flax is writing, he clearly becomes afflicted with whatever disease is affecting the villagers of Morton and the last few entries are completely incomprehensible. They read, Fsies urksul sikluf duftisf, Rgul splats fisir seal, Raditz ufa spokes me too, Wet lands in dais tinker. So, me being me, I wanted to see if this actually meant anything. I read it backwards, obviously nothing there. I read it as an anagram, nothing there either. And finally, I decided to see if there was some kind of substitution cipher in play, couldn't find anything of note. I eventually went and looked into the afflicted, who are the NPCs in Morton who are affected by this disease. They also speak in this apparent nonsensical language. Upon reading their transcript page, it became clear that these are random words just randomly thrown together. Because when you look at their dialogue, they can get just any combinations of these words, like nots, 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 nots. Some of these words look like they're in English, but I think that's just a mess with us. So, congratulations, Jagex, you've messed with me. We all know the crazy archaeologist and the deranged archaeologist, but did you know that there's a third archaeologist that's not doing well? His name is Charles Charlington, which, heckin' great name, my guy. But he exists in a small, closed-off area in the Tar Swamp where you can also find the deranged archaeologist. You can only get to him by using breadcrumbs on a mushroom found to the southwest of the sticky swamp destination of the mycelium transportation system. If you search him, you will get the archaeologist's diary, which is just ramblings of an insane man. He obsesses over someone named Skelly with one L. On day 19, the archaeologist begins logging his journey. Lost. Swamp. Eating away at everything I've ever known. Everyone I've ever loved. It's fine though, isn't it? Everything is fine. Skelly over there is keeping me company. Day in, day out, never leaving my side. On day 23, things progress. Skelly is angry with me. I don't know why. I snapped at him earlier, for what I don't remember. My mind is slowly deteriorating. This swamp is evil. I just want it to stop, to be over. Please, someone find me. 12 days later, he's doing worse. A month it's been. 
Yes, over a month it has, wandering my new home with new friends and creatures and mushrooms and vines and plants and... Ooh, Skelly. Yes, Skelly is back. I like Skelly. I'm friends with Skelly again. He doesn't do things anymore, though, ever since the backstabbing, but we don't talk about that. No, we don't. No more death from above. No, no, no. That scares me. On day 39, bread. I found bread. Why bread? Why breadcrumbs? I've tried to speak to Belle, but she just ignores me. One time she tried to eat me. I think that's how I'm here. I, I can't remember. Skelly is doing well. He says we can go to somewhere new later. That's exciting. Yes, very exciting. And his final entry, day 47. Simply, where's Skelly? And that's all we know about Charles Charlington. Hey, you want to hear a diary from another person who's not doing well? Yeah, of course you do. Of course you do. This next one from Silas, who is Jossick's missing uncle. Jossick, if you remember, is the current owner of the lighthouse. This diary is from the Horror of the Deep Quest. It's basically the journey of a man who becomes a scaly, obsessed with Dagonoff and the sea, and overall he's not doing great, but there are a few interesting lines that I'd like to read to you which may point to what happened to him. Dagonoff, I know thee, I call thee. For I, too, am of the ocean, for I, too, call this land home. I find myself thinking of a time when we can all be together as one in the deep sea. At this point, he goes on and on about creating the door in which you have to shove in four runes and an arrow and a sword and get to the Dagonoff. Then he writes, The door. Dagonoff. Will I wake one day and find that my life has been naught but a dream? And that under my skin... Under my bones, I too am Dagonoff? Near the end, he writes, I come to thee tonight, Dagonoff. I know not how this ends, but will now find out. Dagonoff, me. Can you become me? Or can I somehow become you? Now, in all likelihood, these are just the ramblings of some guy who found some neat dinosaurs in his basement, became obsessed with them, and got eaten by one. But... When you come to the lighthouse from Waterbirth Island, you crawl out of the water the same way the Dagonoth do in Horror from the Deep. And that entrance is right next to the Dagonoth King's Lair. Just saying, maybe Silas did become a Dagonoth and became one of the Dagonoth Kings. I don't know. That'd be neat. That'd be neat. In any case, he is way too obsessed with these shark guys. Next up, I want to talk about a pair of books that you can find in the Shades of Morton minigame. These books are basically just used in order to get the ability to create swamp bark or blood bark armor, but in reading the journals, there's a lot more to them. The Tree Wizard's Journal, from which you get the rune scroll of swamp bark, describes the tale of Zacid Vir, a Zemarakian mage who finds the ruins of Flamter, which is basically just the temple that you rebuild in Shades of Morton. However, he describes a tree, a tree that drew him in and eventually forced him to become part of the tree itself. Now, the bloody notes from which you get the runes called Bloodbark are written by an acolyte named Otrava. She is also exploring the ruins of Flamter and discovers this same tree. Through a hole in the tree, she can see a man, unconscious. We have to assume that this is Zasadvir. She recites a binding spell that the tree itself instructs her to perform. When she awakes the next morning, the hole in the tree and the man are gone, and in their place is nothing but an eerie smile. So here's the thing. There are no evil trees around the Flamter Temple, so we have to assume that the ruins extend somehow and that there is a tree out there that we haven't seen yet. This could be some kind of corrupt spirit tree or something else entirely, but this is cause for concern. Creepy smiling tree, not my favorite. If you travel to the east of Wintertod, you will come across the Fishing Hamlet. There, you can find something called the Smelly Journal, which is a collection of letters written from a Fremenic to someone named Lensa. If you use this journal on Lensa of Yatiso or Lensa of Relica, nothing happens, so this must be some third extra special Lensa. It describes them landing in this Fishing Hamlet, which at the time of writing is lively and full of villagers who are eager to help. The Fremenics fish up a snake stone, which they begin muttering to, and apparently it mutters back. On September 19th of the year 166, 
Yardor, one of the Fremenex in this band, has turned to drinking the ocean as he says it'll bring him closer to the gods. Hey, do you guys want to see my Yardor impression? I'm getting closer to the gods! Two days later, all the villagers are gone. Something took them in the night, and all trails lead them to an ominous crevasse. The author says he wants to convince the others to flee now before it's too late. But two days later, his entry simply states, It spoke to me. I'm going to stay now. Another two days later, and apparently one of the Fremenix tried to throw the snake stone back into the ocean, and the others made an example of him and state that he'll be troubling us no more. The next entry, unlike the others, does not have a date. Instead, is simply called Ire of Fyrus, with question marks following it that seem to indicate that it could be a date. And it simply states, Praise him, praise him, praise him. Tonight, we ascend. As far as I can tell, neither this journal nor the fishing hamlet itself are used in any quest or referred to at all. So I have to assume that there's some storyline that's either being continued or started here. Either way, very spoopy. The final book on my list is The Weeping which is a book that can be found in the Myths Guild library after completing Dragon Slayer 2. It is, simply put, a horror story, and I do encourage you to read the whole thing as it's very well written, but I'll be giving you a high-level overview of it now. The story begins with our hero, Herbert Dunwich, wandering the northernmost shores of Farinthri, now known as the Wilderness. This takes place during the Age of the God Wars. Herbert, however, chose no side, which makes him an outcast to everyone and so seeks out the quiet places of the world. In what he describes as the northernmost part of the world, he finds an impossibly deep hole. The only thing he can perceive from this hole is a soft, sorrowful weeping. It's a woman's voice, and he can tell she's in dire need of aid. So bravely, he attaches a long rope to a nearby tree and lowers himself into this eternal darkness. When he reaches the bottom, he raises his lantern and notices he's in the middle of a large cavern adorned on all sides by murals, most depicting Xeros, the Empty Lord. He continues through this cavern, wandering deeper and deeper towards the source of the weeping, and finally finds an ancient door. He heaves it open and immediately comes face to face with a hulking behemoth with spindly arms and razor-sharp talons. It lets out a scream of utter grief. Our hero runs. He returns back to the rope that he's left in the center of the cavern, and he climbs as fast as he can. The screams and the wailing are drawing ever closer, but somehow he emerges back onto the surface. The final lines of the book read this. There are mysteries that should never be solved. Some secrets should remain buried and forgotten. Now we don't conclusively know if this story is real or not, but if it is, it's very likely that he has encountered Nex. Nex is a hulking monster with long arms and razor-sharp talons that is in service to the Empty Lord Xeros. However, if we look at this from an analog horror perspective, maybe he stumbled into the back rooms and this large, spindly-armed monster that can perfectly imitate human voices is the same one found in Kane Pixel's excellent back room series. Just something to think on, you know. Anyway, that's going to wrap it up for this video. Jagex, you always do an incredible job of adding life and color to a giant world that you've created, and I applaud you for it. I just want to finish this video off with a massive thank you to all of you. Not only have you rocketed me past 1,000 subscribers, I am now officially a YouTube partner. This is super exciting, and I want to thank everyone who supported me this far. Say. Anyway, I'll see you next time, and thank you very much for watching.